All right, hey, welcome my math friends. And especially my friends who were in Washington DC last week, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your, your trip to our nation's capital. You learned some things and had a lot of fun along the way. Now, while you were there, we were back here in good old Eastern, and we were working, going a little bit deeper into chapter two. We didn't go ahead yet. We're gonna start chapter three this week, but um, we went a little bit deeper into chapter two and solved some problems each day um, especially spent some time on the end of chapter two where we did the transformation of functions. And I feel like uh, by the end of the week, the people that stayed behind were in a much strong, we have a much stronger foundation in chapter two in functions. So I want to give people who are in Washington an opportunity to kind of catch up a little bit, um, build your foundation a little bit more, and the rest of us is just going to get stronger and stronger. So I thought let's start today by kind of coming together and we'll do a an overview of everything in chapter two, all the key points. So it's like a perfect time for a lecture. And I thought, hey, let's try something a little different rather than going down to Mr. Jason's room and sitting down and I could just go over the lecture in person and you all would take notes and which would inevitably turn into a 55 minute period. I thought, let me try to do this at home, be a little more concise and give you an opportunity to just take notes as you watch my lecture here. We'll see how this goes. So you let me know what you think about it. So let's begin. Take a breath, three breaths, all right? Just maybe close your eyes. Just get yourself in a calm place. So I'm just going to inhale, exhale, inhale, and exhale. One more time. Okay, good. Hopefully you're a little more um, calm and settled in. Just um, don't worry about how long this is going to be. This is going to be a little longer than our typical video. And uh, please, what I'd like you to do is take notes as you watch this video. And I'm going to come around in the room while you're watching and just check in on you. And I'm going to actually give you points today for just taking notes. So do a good job. What I'm going to suggest you do is open up the other screen right now. You can pause this video. Open the other screen and bring it to the book and bring it to chapter two right at the beginning. And I'm gonna try, I don't have the book in front of me, but I remember it pretty well. I'm gonna to try to basically kind of flow through sections 2.1 through 2.4 and hit the highlights, do a problem here or there. I have my little whiteboard. So I don't know how that's gonna come out. We'll try it and we'll see. Um, so let's, um, let's just give it a shot. So chapter two, functions. All right, here you go, starting your notes. You can write that down. Um, the definition of function. I, I, someone has had it right away the first day, I remember. It was for every input, you have only one output. That's just a nice, it's, a, it's not necessarily a precise mathematical definition, but I think it serves you well. So write that down. For every input, just a single output. And it's not necessarily unique, right? Because you could have an input five and comes out seven. And then you can have another input, 10, and it could also come out seven, that's okay. So the outputs don't have to be unique, but each input can only have one output. So that brings us to a couple um, terms right away for your notes. The term input is equivalent to domain. So let's write that down. Output is equivalent to range. What goes in is your domain, what comes out is your range. Another term is independent variable. That's also the same thing as input or domain. And what comes out is your dependent variable. So that's all terms, vocabulary that you should be very familiar with. Next, the idea of the domain having to perhaps be restricted will come up with functions. So when you think of a function, there should be two um, functions, two, um, what would you call them? Two different scenarios that automatically raise red flags. And if you know what that means, a red flag is like it calls attention to itself. And you see something like this, you want to like zero in on it. And hopefully you remember those two situations are square roots. If you have a function that has a square root at any point in it, that's a problem. Why? Think about that. Why? What's wrong with square roots? What's, what do you have to be careful about? And hopefully you remember, you can't do square roots of negative numbers. So you can't take the square root of negative five. We don't know how to do that. 
So if you have a square root of say x, let's just say our function was f of x equals square root of x, you're gonna to have to make a note that I hope you can see that there's a nice there's a that's better. That the domain, the x can't be all right, it's better in this case to write what x can be. X has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? We could say x can't be less than zero. It can't be negative. Either way, you could express that would be correct. So you have, there's a restriction in the domain for square roots, and the other restriction is if you have, what is it? What's the other type of function you're looking out for? Fraction, I heard someone say. So if you have a domain like say x, one over x plus five, then you'd have to say for this problem, x cannot equal negative five, x can be an element of all real numbers, something like that. So don't forget you wanna say that second part too. So x can be anything except it can't be negative five, why? Because with a fraction, you can't let the denominator equal zero. If it equals zero, then uh, you can't divide by zero, so then it becomes undefined. Which is, as a little note, if you remember in chapter, in section 2.4, when we start to graph these functions, and you see those asymptotes, those lines that the function goes towards that point but doesn't quite get there, that's usually because you're dividing by zero. I think it's all, always because you're dividing by zero that you have that situation. All right, so that's... 2.1, um, one other thing you have, your, you have your restrictions of your domains, and your syntax is the last thing. Your syntax is like how they'd express a function. So just remember, um, I think most of you are pretty comfortable with f of x equals whatever, x squared plus five. But they also had this weird way of doing it. If I can remember it right, I had my notes, where they wrote f colon x and had a little line with an arrow x squared plus five. It's just, this, it's the same thing. All right, it's just another way of writing a function. So make a note of that in your notes that that's just a different way of writing it. Then the last thing you wanna be uh, familiar and comfortable with 2.1 is evaluating your functions. In other words, if I give you, um, I give you values for x and then you figure out what the function equals. And you guys are used to doing that with lines, right? You remember you used to do this where you make your little charts and y would be equal to say x squared plus five. And I would say evaluate this function when x is seven and you'd stick seven in and you'd do your thing and you'd get a y value out. So no big deal on 2.1, that should be pretty good. 2.2, we went to composite functions. When you take two functions, they could be the same function and then you compose them, you like bring them together and you create a new function. So. Let's start with the syntax. Syntax, once again, how do you write that? Simply, it's kind of like learning your grammar. So there was two different ways to write it. The way that I think is most intuitive is you have f of g of x, right? That's composing. You're gonna take the, the first function, g of x, and you're gonna stick it inside of the second function, f of, of x, and then you're gonna do some algebra to it. But you could also express that as f, and I don't know what you call that little open circle, g. Or as John likes to say, fog. Or they could flip it around and say, go off, g of f of x. So these are all different ways of writing composing functions, composition of functions. That's your syntax. What, the, we started 2.2 with evaluating a composition of functions which was, that's the simplest thing. So if I have two functions, let's say I have f of x equals x squared plus three, and I have g of x equal to just say x minus two. All right, not too bad. And then the, the question, let's say the question said, find, um, evaluate f composed with g when x is three. So it's giving us a particular value of x that it wants us to solve for. Those are the easiest ones. All, it's, all you have to do is, you have to know when they write in this order, which one do I do first, the F or the G? Since the G's on the inside, that's the one you're gonna do first. You could rewrite it, just to remind yourself, F of G of three is what they're trying to ask us to do. 
So you need to take the three and you stick it into the G first. So instead of, I'm gonna write G of three equals three, because I substituted in for the X, minus two, which simply equals one. So now I know what G of three equals. The, the thing you have to remember that um, you don't take that three and stick it in the F, you take the one. So once you find the G, you take that answer and you plug that into F. So F of one equals one squared plus three, which of course equals four. So there's your final answer. F of G, F composed with G at the point three is going to equal to four. Not so bad. Then the second problem, style problem, because a little more complicated, is instead of evaluating it at a particular point, they just ask you to just solve it in general. Um, so there's no point three. They're just saying, just tell me what is, I hope this angle isn't too bad. Just tell me what is uh, F composed with G of X. And then you take the entire uh, expression, if you will, the entire function of G, and you have to plug it into wherever there's an X inside the F. So I would rewrite that and I would say, instead of X squared, I put parentheses wherever I'm substituting it. And then that's squared plus three. And then that was one thing that a lot of you guys got wrong in the test. Remember, when you have X minus two squared, that is not, you cannot take that squared and like distribute it because there's a minus inside the parentheses. So that is a, um, a, a problem where you have to do your FOIL. You have to expand that out. So we have to write it out X minus two times X minus two plus three. And remember your FOIL, it's your first term, outside term, inside term, and last term. So the first term is X times X is X squared. The outside term is X and negative two, so it's negative two X. The inside terms are negative two and times X, that's another negative two X. And then the last terms are negative two times negative two, which is positive four, plus three. So X squared minus four X, because those two combine, plus seven. That would be the composition between F and G um, without you know evaluating anything else. Now what they do, and the problem in the book, in the review, they introduced a new idea. They said, solve f of g of x if it equals, say, 10. Now, that was a little bit weird, and I gave you guys a warm-up. I gave the people here a warm-up on that problem on Friday. So it's a little confusing because some people, they thought initially they wanted you to take that 10 and substitute it in for the x, but the, what they want you to do is go through your whole process, and at the very end, set it equal to 10, and then solve for x. So they're saying, what would x be what, what would X have to be to make that composition equal 10? Or they also, I think in the book they said, they did it with an inversion problem. Invert the function, what's the, what would be, um, you know, what would X have to be to have the inversion of G equal to 10? Something like that. So look out for those style of problems. All right, 2.2, anything else? We did evaluate, we found the composite. Oh, last thing, um, the domain. Finding the domain of the, composed function. That part is a little bit more um, going on there. So remembering to find the domain of the final function. So what we're talking about here is finding the domain of f of g of x or fog. What you have to do for these problems is you have to, it's kind of two steps. You're going to look, since you're going to do the, the inside term first, the inside function, g of x, you do have to first examine g of x and see if there's any restrictions. So just for an example, let's say that f of x was equal to 1 over x plus 5. And let's say g of x was equal to square root of x minus 3. Something like that. Um, and then you can see that. Hopefully. So you have to first look at g of x and note to yourself in the paper, are there any restrictions to this domain? And since it's a square root and we can't do square root of negative numbers, there is a restriction, right? x has to be greater than or equal to 
3. I think I did that right. Let's check that. So if x is 3, 3 minus 3 is 0, the square root is 0, 0. I can do that. But if x is a little bit less than 3, let's say it's 2, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. I can't do square root. So that's you have to keep that in mind. The original g has a restriction on the domain. So just kind of note that and then go ahead and do the rest of the problem. We're going to take the g of x. We're going to substitute it in for the f of x. So I'm going to say f composed of the g is equal to take that g, substitute it in here. There you go. And then I'm going to work through the algebra to simplify that. So I'm going to say, OK. Um, well, that's a nasty little problem, isn't it? Because I have to rationalize the denominator. Oh, God, what did I get myself into? So I'm going to have to square root of x minus 3 minus 5 and multiply that in the top as well. Um, and then I'm going to get a nice old uh, FOIL problem <laughs> where the middle terms cross off. So square root of that times square root of that is going to simply be x minus 3. Then this term and this term cancel off, and I have plus 5 times negative 5 is minus 25. And on top, I have square root of x minus 3 minus 5. And then I can bring stuff together down to the bottom. So I have square root of x minus 3 minus 5 on top. I can't really combine those. And then in the bottom, I'm going to have x minus 28. And that's just a nasty looking function. But the trick is I'm trying to find out what is the domain. So when I look at this, I say, hey, there's a restriction here on the domain. I can't let x be 28 because I have a fraction. If x is 28, that's going to become 0. I can't do that. So I'm going to say x can't be 28. And I luckily, I still have that original um, problem because I can't let that become negative. Um, I can't let that become a negative number. So that original restriction is still true. Um, and what I want to point out to you is sometimes an x can be anything else. x is an element of all real numbers except those two notes. Um, I guess you could just say x is greater than or equal to 3, but x can't be 28. That would be a, probably the most elegant, simple way of, say, of stating that. But what I wanted to, to, just to make sure you understand is sometimes when you compose a function, the final composed function won't have any restrictions. It won't have that same restriction that the original, because that restriction kind of goes away when you do the algebra. So if that does happen, though, you still have to note it, because it just doesn't make sense logically that if your original function, your g, had a restriction, you can't just like lose that restriction. Even though once you do the algebra with the composition, it seems like in the final answer there's no more restriction, there is one because you know that in order to get to that final answer, you did have to start with the, the in inside function, the first function, g. So just remember that when you're figuring out domains, um, when you're doing composing functions, find the restriction, if there are any restrictions, on the original function, the first function, note those, and then go ahead and do the rest of the problem, do your composition, simplify it, see if there's any more restrictions, and then the final domain will have both of those restrictions. Okay, hopefully that was not too bad. Um, and you took some notes along the way. If you're a little confused, you know, you pause it here, you go to 2.2, and hopefully you're there in the book right now. You look at a problem or two, and you just solve a problem. Do a problem. That, that's the best way to do it. Taking some of these notes, and then just test yourself with a problem here or there. All right, I'm going to pause this now, end of part one here, and then I'm going to come back and do a second lecture for 2.3 and which is inverting fractions, and 2.4, which is transforming them.